All right, so can everybody hear me? Yeah. Everybody hear me good? Yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. Have a seat, have a seat. So he called me, so 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 my brother called me like like two months ago. And so he called me like two months ago and he was like, hey, shock. At the end of July, I'm gonna have a ministry for the youth. I'm gonna have an extravaganza. I want you to come and speak. I was like, you want me to come and speak to your church? He was like, yeah, I want you to come speak to my church. I was like, oh, okay, all right, cool, man. <laughs> you know, I, I, don't, I don't speak to, to, to churches. You know, this is my first time speaking in the church. Yeah. I speak to businesses. I speak to car dealerships. But in church, I mean, you got to come with it. <laughs> you know, especially because all you, you got preachers who are coming with it every Sunday. You got yeah. multiple preachers who are coming with it every Sunday. So I was like, man, you know, at least the car dealership is just me. <laughs> you know, so, 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 so he asked me. And immediately, oh, immediately, I, I jumped into fear thinking. Wow. I jumped into fear thinking. So I didn't give him, a, give him an answer immediately. I didn't immediately say yes, yes. I said, hey, man, you know what? Uh, immediately, I jumped into fear thinking, hey, man, you know what? I don't know what my schedule is going to look like. I don't know if I can make it down to Atlanta. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. So, so I said, I'll let you know. He was like, all right, let, let, let me know. And I got to thinking, after I hung the phone up, I got to thinking, like, okay, shock, this is what you do. I'm not a I, I'm not a preacher. I'm not a preacher, but 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 I do motivational speaking. So yes. I'm not a reverend. I'm not a pastor, but I do do inspirational or motivational speaking. But hey, now I have to I have to not think in fear. Oh. And fear to me means fake excuses and reasons. Yeah. All right. And so I can't have these fake excuses and reasons as to why I won't come and handle this for my brother. And when, when, when I call him my brother, I don't mean like, you yeah, know, he's my brother. I mean, like I'm married to a sister. So like, <laughs> really, 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 that's my brother for real. So I said, I have got to go down. I got to get down to Atlanta and I've got to go down here. I've got to handle this for my brother. I've got to get rid of the fake excuses and reasons. I've got to get yes. rid of fear. So I called him back and I said, yeah, you know what? Bro, I got you. I got you. I'm there. I said, I don't know how, but I know why. And as long as I know why, as long as my why is big enough, my how don't matter. Yes. My how yes. don't matter. Yes. So I said, all right, so I got you. So immediately I started planning. Immediately I started digging deep. All right, how can I get this plane ticket? How can I make the time? How can I schedule myself to make sure I get down to Atlanta so I can come and speak to his church? And the problem is, is out there in some people in here or even out there in the world, their why is not big enough, so they let their how get in the way, and that's oh, why they're not following yeah. their dreams. Right. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. why they're not pushing for their vision. Yeah. It's because yeah. their why is not big enough. Wow. So your, your, your why has to be big enough. Long as your why is big enough, your how don't matter, you'll make a way. How many agree? Yeah. So... So I called him. I was like, "Yeah, you know what? You know what? I'm gonna get down there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get down there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk to to the people in the church. And, and the great news is, is I know most of the people in here. But, but here's what I fear. Can I be honest with y'all? Yeah. So this is a place to be honest, right, Pastor? So, yes. so here's what I fear. I fear that some people in here are gonna leave the same way they came in. Mm, right? I fear like. Some people are just here to be seen like they're going to leave with the same thought, with the same mentality that they walked in with. Yes. Come on now. Right? Wow. Wow. So this is not the time. This is not the place. And this is not the, the spot. Right? you got to come in and you've got you to receive something. There's got to be something you got to get from this. Would you agree? Amen. So therefore, I'm going to ask you guys. I'm going to ask you guys to do me a favor. Okay? To receive this, to think with this with, with an open mind. With an open heart, right? If I get a little choked up, you know, I don't normally talk about my past, like you said. So if I get a little choked up, oh, my, it's just me. You know, I'm just passionate about so I can get a little choked up. Don't worry about it. But 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 right now, can I get everybody to stand up? Yes. I need you guys to do me a favor, okay? I need you guys to do me a favor. I need you guys to repeat after me. Put a put a finger in there. Put a finger there. And I need you to make this pledge, all right? I need you to make everybody's eyes closed. Everybody's eyes closed. And I need you to make this pledge. From this day forward, from this day forward, I pledge, I pledge to do more, to do more, to seek more, to seek more, to become more, to become more. From this day forward, from this day forward, I pledge, I pledge to do more, to do more, to seek more, to seek more, to become more, to become more. Come on, one more time. From this day forward, from this day forward, I pledge, I pledge to do more, to do more, to seek more, to seek more, to become more, to become more. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. See, I guess now you're obligated to 
yourself to walk out better than you walked in. I mean, if you don't lie, you ain't gonna lie to yourself. You know what I mean? All right, so I ain't got a lot of time. I got a lot of time. So I'm gonna talk about, first thing I wanna talk about is this story that I heard back in the day that, that has motivated me my whole life. It's about a college student, okay? I, 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 I be true with you, I never went to college. I don't know how many people in here ever been to college, but I didn't go. I didn't even go to class, right? I hated school, period. So I never went to college, but, I heard the story about this average college student, right? This guy, he went, he, he's an average guy. He does just enough to get through classes, right? He shows up to some of his classes late if he even shows up at all, okay? He's average, he likes to go, and he likes to drink, and he likes to party, stay out late, et cetera. Like most people do on campuses. I mean, I've been on a few campuses. I've been on a few parties. I don't want to get down, right? But like in any college, you can schedule your classes, and every morning he had an 8 o'clock math class. So this one particular Friday, he stayed out late, right? But he had an eight o'clock math class that, that, that following morning, this particular Thursday, sorry, he stayed out late, but that Friday morning, he had an eight o'clock math class. He actually slept in and woke up at 8.30. At 8.30, he woke up. Well, the class is over with at night, so as soon as he woke up, he jumped up, he put on his jockey pants, his jockey shirt, right? He put on his flip flops and he skidded off and ran to class, okay? He ended up getting to class right about 8.50 as the teacher was dismissing. So the teacher was dismissive, but he got in there and the students were walking out, but he got in there and, and he saw two math problems on the board behind the teacher. And so what he did was he ran in there, he got his pen and, he, and his paper, and he started writing down the first math problem. Right, and the first math problem, it looked like Chinese arithmetic, especially if somebody like me is geometry and, and calculus and, 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 and algebra, all wrapped into one, right? X minus Y equal A, B, parentheses, pi, right? So he wrote down, he wrote down the first math problem, okay? And then he started writing down the second one, and the second math problem was longer than the first one. X minus Y parentheses pi squared minus 14,000 to the power. So he wrote down the second math problem. He's like, all right, Dad, I got, you got a top? I got a, uh, oh, look at him all prepared. That's why I love it. All right, so, so therefore, uh, he wrote down his homework. He was like, Ben, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to get this handled. I know the teacher's probably mad at me, and I'm going to turn it in Monday morning. So Saturday morning rolls around, but Friday night, yeah, you guys said he went out drinking, he went out partying and dancing, he went, he got up Saturday morning midday. Got up, got him something to eat, and then he's like, all right, let me tackle his own work real quick. So he dove in. Well, the math problem was harder than he thought, so he whipped out his notes, he whipped out his previous tests, he whipped out his book, and he went to town. He whipped out the computer, did his research, and, and four hours later, he finally got this math problem done. Now, I don't know how many of us would, would work on a math problem for four hours. I, we would have quit a long, long time ago. I know some of us quit on stuff way easier than that. Four hours later, he handled that math problem. All right, he was like, the second one is longer. Uh, I'm not gonna tackle that till tomorrow. So same old, same old, went out Saturday night, woke up the next day, midday, jumped into the next one. Well, the next one was even harder. It took him even longer. It took him six hours to accomplish the next math problem. I'm talking about X minus A, B plus four. I mean, it's, you know, I wouldn't even tackle it. So he was done. Seven o'clock Sunday night, he was like, you know what, I'm not going out. I'm good, I'm good, right? I gotta get to class one time, at least one time, show my face. So Monday morning, he stepped into class at 7.45, it started at eight o'clock, he walked in proud, like what? With his papers, right? Walked straight up to the teacher, and the teacher was like, what's this? What's this? And, and he looked on the first piece of paper, and he noticed on that first piece of paper, he recognized that that was the math problem that was on the board behind him Friday. And then he looked at all the other pieces of paper attached to that, that, that math problem, he's like, what? And then he looked at the next piece of paper, and he knows that's the other math problem that was on the board, and he looked at the other pieces of paper that, that, that were the answer. And then he's looking down at these pieces of paper, shocked. And then he looks up at the guy at the stone, and he was shocked, and he was astounded, and he was bewildered. And, and, and what was even more shocking is the stone was looking back at him like, what, what, what are you looking at? <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought I would get an boy or something like this response. What are you looking at me like that for? Well, if the stone had showed up on Friday on time, he would have known that that's those two math problems were, were, were the subject of a lecture that math historians have said were unsolvable throughout history. Wow. Oh, wow. That those two math problems, no one in the history of the world has been able to solve them. But this college student took down that homework, went to task, 
can solve both problems because he didn't know that he wasn't supposed to be able to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So the lesson I got from that was impossible is nothing yeah. until you allow somebody to convince you that you can do. Yeah. 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 You can accomplish anything. Any vision, any dream you may have, as long as you don't allow somebody to convince you that you can't do it. Amen. That they can't push their limitations. That they can't push that negativity onto you. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, it goes on too much in my own household. I wanted to do something other than an automotive business. I mean, I don't, you know, how many people want to grow to sell cars? Right? <laughs> want to be an actor. And my whole life, my parents were like, hey, make sure you got something to fall back on. Right? Make sure you got a plan B, right? So they pushed that ne- limiting negative limitations on me because they knew or felt that they couldn't do it. And unfortunately, we sabotage our friends, our youth, our children. We sabotage their dreams because we feel like we can't do it. Yeah. Well, again, impossible is nothing until you allow somebody to convince you that you can't do it. Yeah. Come on now. Yeah. How many agree? Amen. Amen. Here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. That life is about two things, man. It's about two things, Pastor. The two things that life is about is, first one is, is about what happens to you. The second is, is what happens because of you. But it's the next one, it's, it's the latter one, it's what happens because of you that matters. Again, life is about two things. The first is what happens to you. But you have no control over what happens to you. You can't control the weather. You can't control Obama. You can't control the economy. You can't control the wars overseas. You can't control those things. Those are things that happen to you. How many agree? But the second is, is what happens because of you. And listen, success is not going to happen to you. It don't work like that. Success will happen because of you. How many agree? So an example of, 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 of things that happen to you. Things that happen to you. So my mother, my mother left me when I was two years old. My biological mother left me when I was two years old. Now it's about to get deep, right? So she left me when I was two years old, and I know I know plenty of people that grow up in, in, in single parent households, right? But I was the only me that I knew that grew up without my mom. I know plenty of people that grew up without their fathers, but I didn't know anybody that grew up without their mother. So so I was confused growing up. I was a confused individual. And being confused, you don't have any certainty. You don't have any confidence growing up when you're confused. When I learned that my mama walked out on me when I was two years old, I couldn't figure it out. Your mother's not supposed to leave you. She gives birth to you, she's supposed to love you. That's supposed to be your back home. My mother cut out on me. Not so much as a goodbye, a handshake, nothing. Right? So in, in, in growing up confused, with no confidence, it kills your self-esteem. So in, when you don't have self-esteem growing up, you overcompensate. You overcompensate by being angry, by being aggressive, by being loud, by being boisterous. I was all of those things. I grew up angry. I grew up, I grew up aggressive. I grew up blaming other people. I grew up as a victim, I felt. And I would walk the halls of my school in that same manner. I would walk the halls of my school angry, aggressive, right? Other people thought I was hardcore. They didn't know. They didn't know, right? They didn't know that I was confused, that I was hurt, that I was scarred because my mother wasn't around. I remember specifically walking in the mall and looking at me and like, man, could that be my mom? Could that be my mom? Right? Because when you're confused and you don't know anyone that's like you. So as a result of me going to school and acting out, Right? As a result of me doing it, my, my school suffered. Yep. My grades suffered. Yep. I was that dude. Right? No good grades ever. My father remarried a woman when I was five years old. So she's a woman that raised me, right? Both of them from the South. And I got to tell you about people from the South. You don't do good in school, they respond with some hardcore oh, discipline. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They come on with it. I didn't have time out when I was growing up. Right? And they responded with the type of discipline that hurts. Right? They believed in education. I didn't care about education. Well, they figured they going to either beat it out of me or they was going to beat it into me, but they was going to beat it. Right? So that's what they did. I brought home D's and F's and they got to beat. And they got to beating and they got to beating. Right? 
And my father beat me so much, he would send me to school with black and blue bruises all over my body. I remember one time, I got a beating so bad, Pastor Pass, I was standing in the middle of my room in my, in, my, in my house, and I remember blood dripping from my fingertips. That's how bad my father used to beat me. And my mother, and my mother would mentally beat me, right? And then punish. We didn't have timeouts when I was growing up. Some of y'all little ones got timeouts nowadays. I wish I had timeouts, right? Yeah. I used to get on punishment, I promise. I, I never knew anybody that got punishment like I did. Like somebody that get punished before a weekend, right? You can't watch TV for a weekend, right? You can't go outside for a week. My punishment lasted nine weeks. Every report card, right? <laughs> And my parents, God bless them, they raised me the best way that they knew how. But the way that they raised me hurts. It hurts. And what hurt more about them is there's no one I could turn to to talk to because nobody would understand what it was that I was going through. See, until you walk in a person's shoes, you cannot judge them because you don't know what they're going through. So I was scarred in addition to being beat on the outside, I was getting killed on the inside. So my punishment will last every nine weeks, you know, I would get this report card, these and F's, nine weeks later, this report card, these and F's, there's a beating and there's punishment. This report card, these and F's, there's a beating and there's punishment. That was my whole life. I gotta tell you, growing up, I spent more time on punishment than off. That's a true statement and it's funny now but man, in life growing up, that scar is deep. That scar is deep. And it took me until I was a grown man to get over it. And I'm talking about well into being a grown man. So here it is. Here it is. I'm going through what I was going through growing up. And so every time I got an opportunity to get out in the street, oh, I was running it. I was running it hard. Because I had everybody else to blame. I was a victim. I had everybody else to blame. Right? I didn't know my own mother. I didn't even know my own siblings. I had no idea. I never met my little sister, born of my biological mother, until I became a grown man. I met her last year, matter of fact, for the first time ever in my life. My older brother has been in prison my whole life and is still in prison right now. I met him outside of prison one time since I've been a grown man. One time. Oh, and, and, but I've shown picture people in here pictures of my brother and all, man, he's swole. I mean, he's like, what, you know, big, yeah. tatted up, yeah. looks like one of them cats on lock up MSNBC, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that dude, right? But this is my flesh and blood, and I don't know who, who he is. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't relate to no one. There's no one I could relate to growing up, no one, not in my house, not anywhere. So I felt like I was alone. I was in a world of seven billion people, but I felt like I was alone. Especially, I was the only cat named Shocker that I knew too. Yeah. <laughs> that meant another cat named Shocker. <laughs> so it growing up that way, I grew up angry and it hurt and it was full of pain. It was, I came to a point where I decided, listen, it ain't worth living no more. It's time to end it. If I died, it would be easier for me than the way that I was living. Yeah, it got there. It got there. So I ran the streets, not acting as if I was hard. I got into all kind of drama. Everything that was a problem, I tried to get right in the middle of it because I, I figured that, listen, I'm not going to kill myself, but if I got shot, and if it was ended, at least somebody going to say some good stuff about me. Because if you notice some in funerals, I don't know how many of you know people who died, especially young cats, but at funerals, boy, they talk them up, don't they? Oh, listen, man, Jose was saved at a young age. I mean, you know, he was confused and people didn't understand him. He was a good dude. He did decent when he was in second grade. I was like, man, I ain't know Pookie was saved. <laughs> no, I ain't know Pookie was saved. I'm like, that's a different Pookie than I know. Right? But they talk all kind of good stuff about people when they die figuring, listen, that's how I'm going to go out. Yeah. Or I'm going to end up like my brother. I'm going to do it like my brother. Free Pookie, right? My brother was free Paco, right? <laughs> free Jason, free whoever. I was like, yeah, I'm going to be somebody. I can get locked up. We can do this. But guess what? It never happened. It never happened. What did happen was is I ended up getting expelled from high school for fighting. And I dropped out. I was done. 
I couldn't handle it no more. I didn't die, but I dropped out of high school. And when I dropped out, I ran away from home too. I went to New York City. I jumped on the bus, my parents went to school, I packed up my luggage and it's gone. It's always coming to a head, right? So I got to New York City and I figured, listen, I'm gonna get to New York City, I'm gonna go up there, I'm gonna run the streets, right? And I'm gonna go be with my cousin who was pursuing an acting career. I was like, yes, I'm gonna be on a set of movies and I'm gonna run the streets like they do in New York. I saw the videos on BT, right? That's how I'm gonna be, I saw them, right? Well, it didn't work out that way. One two was like, no, no, you got the wrong idea. You need to go back to Indiana, and you need to finish school. I said, go back home. I said, go back home. Go home? I said, home is where hell is happening. I can't go back home. But guess where I went? She shipped me right on back to Indiana, <laughs> right? So when I went back to Indiana, I didn't go home. I'm, like, I'm out. What was the job for? And some people know what job for is, but but, but let me tell you, the commercials will fool you, uh -huh. right? The commercials, it shows people happy and, and eating lunch and talking to the teacher and living in the dorms and it's all, no, well, it ain't that way. <laughs> it ain't that way. Job Corps is a place that they give adults and youth second and third chances. The people who can make it in society, that's who they send to Job Corps, right? I don't want to lock you up in juvenile detention forever, so if you can make it through the job court, then you'll be all right. Listen, I'm going to suspend this 10-year sentence for your robbery. If you, I'm going to send you to job court. If you can, I'm in job court with five to 600 gang members. People from Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, Flint, Gary, Indiana. They say prison is the place, if you want to learn how to be a criminal, go to prison. You want to know how to be a gang member, come to job court. Wow. Come to job court. Jumped a couple of times, room set on fire, around, surrounded by gang members. Oh, I learned the lid. I learned how to hit, uh, the handshake. I know what colors to wear, what not to wear. I know what symbols meant on, on shirts and on jackets. I know the, I, I found out who the who was who. I learned about Larry. I, I learned about them all. Right? I was learning. And but somehow, some way I managed to finish up school while I was in there. Some way, somehow. I managed to get me a trade yes. while I was in there. Some way, somehow, I squeezed that out. And I also met my daughter's mother. The girl, she became my girlfriend, but the, but the, but the, the lady who will become my daughter's mother. So here it is. I'm 17 in job corps. I turned 18. I actually ended up, gra I was one of the cats that graduated. Of all the cats there in job corps, so I made it out. I'm 18 years old. I got a girlfriend pregnant. I got my girlfriend pregnant. So now I'm like, all right, so now I got to do something, right? I got to do something. I got a girl pregnant. I'm out of job where I'm poor. I don't have the resources everybody has. I don't have the education that everybody has. My own family don't love me, but I got to do something, right? So I went and got a rundown apartment in the basement of a rundown building in the middle of a rundown neighborhood. I was 18 years old, right? Like I got to do this. And that's the apartment that I brought my daughter home to. She was born October 11th, 1996. And I remember as an 18 year old being in that hospital room and I saw my daughter born in that delivery room and, and, and the nurse took her out, you know, and the nurse washed her up and, and, and took her footprints and, and wrapped up in a blanket and put her in the incubator and the nurse allowed me, this little 18 year old kid, to wheel my daughter out into the nursery. And I remember right then and there, that's when I, that fork in the road. I was scared, I was fearful, but I knew that this little girl right now, I would never leave my daughter. When my brother came to that fork in the road, she decided to let me go. And I remember the damage that that did to me growing up. So when it came to me, I knew that I would never leave my, woo! It's funny how things come full circle. All right. It's funny how things come full circle. I knew that this little girl depended on me. I knew that I wanted to provide this little girl with the life I never had. I wanted to show her love that I never got from my own mother, right? 1996, October 11th, your boy became a father, your boy became a man yes. at that point in time. Yes. So I started grinding. I started grinding right then and there. And what I figured, what I found was is that if I was going to get success, I couldn't wait on success to come to me. They not handing out success to Target. You can't get success on the ground shelf at the grocery store. FedEx, 
is not delivering success to your house. You've got to go out and get it. So it's all on you. So this success started with me and I was grinding. $7 an hour, $240 a week take home. Less than a thousand, but I was grinding, right? Because I had a little girl. My mind was bigger than my house. I was out there getting it. And I was in a sewing company working next to 45 year olds and 50 year olds making 12 bucks an hour who said they gonna make that their career. I was next to them 18 making seven bucks an hour and I was growing right next to them. Cause I wasn't giving up, right? And so what I knew was this, is that I was at this, I was, I was at this crossroads where I was poor, but I was doing it the right way. I was grinding, but not grinding illegally, right? right. I remember the first year I filed taxes, 18 years old. I filed taxes and the lady told me that you get a $3,000 extra tax incentive. First of all, three grand is a lot of money. I was like, no, you're rich. <laughs> no. The second thing is she said, you get this three grand tax incentive because this year you made below the poverty line. I said, the poverty line? I didn't even know there was a such thing as a poverty line. I had no idea. Because when you're poor, you don't know how poor you are because everyone around you is poor. There ain't nobody that's, that, that's, that's living well off or in the suburbs. It's not like you poor and you living among rich people. When you poor in your building, the same poor people. They get the assistance, right? They out there game making. There's women out there prostituting. This was my life. But I was out there getting it, right? And I decided at that point in time that, that although I didn't have the education, although I didn't have the resources, although I wasn't wealthy like most people, I decided right then that I had to push past my limitations. I had to go out there and get it. You know, here's, what, here, here's what's funny. As I read another story, you don't mind if I share another story with you, right? About this little, little girl, right, born in poverty. In Mississippi, Mississippi, eh? right? In Mississippi, and 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 this little girl, she was born in such poverty that in her house she didn't have electricity, she didn't have running water. I read she had an outhouse. Now I don't know how many of you are poor, have been poor, whatever, right? But I know everybody in here got electricity. I know everybody in here got running water, right? Ain't trucking out to an outhouse to do this, right? She had an outhouse. Grew up in that in such destitute poverty, and she started getting molested when she was small. She was just little. Started getting molested, raped for the first time when she was nine years old. And by the time she was in fifth grade, she said she was getting raped so much that she was shocked that she didn't end up pregnant in fifth grade. Well, by the time she was 14, she did end up pregnant. And she did end up having a child at 14. And when she had that child, her mother, her mother disowned her. Her mother said, listen, I can't afford to, to, to feed you, to feed this child, and to feed myself. You got to go. But at 14, you can't kick your kid out of your house. So she said, I'm going to send you to the detention home. I'm going to send you to the detention home for bad girls. And sure did, took her down to the detention home in Mississippi. Well, at this detention home for bad girls, it was a two-week waiting list at this detention home. So the mom was like, yup, yup. I'm signing you up. Two weeks from now, you <laughs> wow. I'm signing you up, right? And so she signed her up. Well, in that two weeks, while they were waiting to get to that detention home, the little baby died. The little baby passed away. So her mom saw that as an opportunity to get her out of the house. Your baby's dead. It's just you. It's time for you to go. Sent her to Nashville, Tennessee to live, to live with her dad. Yep. And when she got up there with her dad, her dad put the clamps down, started putting rules in place, started getting strict. He said that I want more for you, I see more for you, and I don't want your circumstance to determine your present stance. Yes. Oh. You've got it in you. I see more for you than what your circumstances said you can do. So she buckled down, she got her schoolwork, right? And surprisingly, she was pretty good at school. Or like me, she was pretty good at school, right? So she dove in, started doing homework, started getting good grades, right? And at 17 years old, listen to this. At 17 years old, she had the audacity to enter a beauty pageant. This little poor girl from Mississippi who was abused her whole life, raped, had a kid when she was poor, had the audacity to get into a beauty pageant when she was 17. And she said, that in this beauty pageant, 
that that they they wanted the contestants to talk about their career goals. You know what you want to be when you grow up, kind of vision, what kind of career path. So she said the one contestant said, "Hey, I want to be a doctor." The next lady said, "Hey, I want to be a lawyer." Then the one other one said, "I want to be a pediatrician." The other one said, "I want to be a veterinarian." She said, "Well, all the careers were taken." So I said, "I want to be a TV journalist." She said, "I want to be a TV journalist." And so after she won the beauty pageant, after she won that, she was so inspired that she followed her vision and she became a TV journalist. And for 25 years, Oprah Winfrey had the number one talk show in the whole world. They have called Oprah Winfrey one of the most influential people on the planet. They said that she is the most influential person, female, in American history owns her own company, which includes movies, which includes a magazine, which includes her own channel, Oprah Winfrey Network. Oprah Winfrey is the first African-American female billionaire the world has ever seen. She pushed past her limitations. She didn't know that it was impossible. She didn't let her circumstance determine her present stance. She said, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen because of me. How many agree? She took a hold of her life and she went after it. Listen, life, I'm a witness. Life is going to do everything it can to knock you down. The world is going to do everything it can to take your life from you and make you a victim. But it's up to you to fight back. It's up to you to take your life back. You have to know that you can do anything. You have to know that you are in charge. And when you walk in a the room, they got to know that you got this. You, when you walk in a room, you got to walk in with confidence. And if you don't know the answer, I know how to get it. You are in charge. You are not a victim. I had to get past, past blaming my parents. I had to get past blaming my circumstance. It's on me now. If I'm going to grow, if I'm going to elevate my game, it's me. I have to do this. So at 21, I dove into the car business, right? And for the first time, I saw people who I thought were successful, right? They had a little bit of money, right? I met people who were making 100 grand a year. I ain't never seen anybody in real life that made 100 grand a year before, right? I got in the car business. They were successful. You're making 100 grand. I was like, y'all, you know, y'all making 100 grand. So... I started reading what they read. I started watching what they watched, dressing like they dressed, right? I wanted to know what was important to them. I wanted to know what it is that they looked at, what were their views like? Because again, although I didn't have the money, the resources, the education, the background, although I didn't have all those things, I had an ace in the hole. And my ace in my pocket was, I would never let anyone outwork me. I'm in charge here. So I kept pushing. At 23 years old, I became a finance manager. 23. That was in 1999. In 2001, I became a finance manager. And to this day, I oversee the finance departments for 27 dealerships across the country. <laughs> Handling business, you're in charge here. Today, when we talk about this little girl that I had at 18 years old, she graduated high school with me. She starts college in August. When we talk about this dysfunctional family I grew up in, I'm married now to a beautiful woman and I've got two great, wonderful kids, one of them which is here right now. You're in charge, right? Although I was poor and although I came up in a broken home and when I became a young adult, I lived in poverty, I make over six figures now. I'm known all over the country for being a motivational speaker now. I got this. I got this. You do not let your circumstance determine your present stance. How many agree? You got this. You are in charge. You are in charge. There's going to be many challenges and many obstacles. Yes. You're going to have to hustle through hardships. Yes. You're going to have to deal with challenges. Yes. You're going to have people hating on you. Yes. You're going to have people trying to hold you back. Yes. They're going to push their limitation on you. Yes. But you got to know you got to hustle through hardships. Yes. yes. You got to push past the pain. Yes. You got to hustle. You got to get through the greatness. Yes. 
Preach it. You have pride, your brain is yes. And when you come to that fork in the road and all is gone wrong and you can't go on, yeah. I need you to not quit. I need you to keep going. Yeah. And I need you to know that you are in charge. Yeah. Somebody say I'm in charge. Yeah. Somebody say I'm in charge. Yeah. Come on, guys, I'm in charge. I'm in charge. New life. You got this. You are in charge. Yeah. 